My name is Tom Switzer. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Independent Studies and it's great privilege and pleasure to welcome our guest speaker here this evening. John Bolton, as many of you know, has been a leading foreign policy figure in Washington for more than three decades, going back to the Reagan era. And among other official positions, John has served as the US Ambassador to the United Nations in the George W. Bush administration. And of course, more recently in 2018, 2019, he served as the National Security Advisor to President Donald Trump. He's also author of several prominent books, including most recently, The Room Where It Happened, a White House memoir. I first met John 25 years ago uh, when we both worked at the Washington-based American Enterprise Institute, and we've been friends ever since. Now, some might say that John's temperament is the antithesis of the conventional diplomat. He is a man of extraordinarily strong views. Some might say he's also intense and driven and not someone who you go to for small talk, which perhaps explain why John Bolton has been such a great critic of the United Nations. <laughs> and with that, it's a great pleasure to welcome the 2022 John Benithan Lecture, John Bolton. Well, Tom, thanks very much, and thanks for, uh, for inviting me uh, to Australia. Thanks to all of you for uh, attending uh, this evening, and uh, I can tell you as, a, as an alumnus of uh, AEI, as Tom said, uh, the support that people give to think tanks, independent think tanks, uh, even if sometimes the scholars there write uh, articles that are not exactly what your point of view is, that's what you're paying for. If you don't have independent thinkers, uh, the orthodoxy is never going to get challenged, and if you believe in freedom, you need to give space to the people who believe in freedom to express views, uh, even if they're not entirely congruent with yours. So it's a tribute to all of you for supporting CIS. And, uh, and I, hope, I hope you see uh, ways to help contribute in the future because the battle for ideas is ultimately what determines success in uh, politics and democratic societies. I want to talk tonight about uh, the state of play in the world, so you'll forgive me if I go quickly because there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, but I think that um, uh, uh, in many respects, uh, understanding of the evolving international situation, particularly with respect to China, has proceeded further in Australia uh, than it has in the United States. I think we're catching up in many respects, but it, it really was... Uh, in, in, uh, in recent governments in, in this country that uh, many of the problems with China that are now more, under, more well understood uh, across the uh, industrial democracies uh, began here. But my, my emphasis really is to try and uh, help people understand that while uh, the threat of China is very real, the world still remains complicated. And part of what we have to do here is deal with what I have called a China-Russia entente, not a formal alliance, not yet an axis of any kind, but the old French word that indicates a, a certain uh, a congruence of interest and values that are being played out around the world. And it's understanding that, I think, especially in the United States, that's going to be important going ahead. So let's just take a little bit of history here with respect to China in particular, but also Russia, because history informs uh, what the uh, current government in Beijing is doing, even though ideologically over uh, decades it's gone through transformations, fundamental perceptions of Chinese interest haven't changed. So, you know, after the communists came to power, the, the party was uh, decidedly Stalinist in its view of the world. And uh, when Khrushchev took power, they began to get unhappy and, uh, and, and things began to change. But the, the, some of the fundamental aspects that confronted China uh, were, were evident right at the beginning. In the middle of the Cold War, 
1958 bombardment of Kimoi and Matsu, little islands right off the coast of China, uh, almost brought confrontation with the United States then. Uh, and it's an amazing tribute to Dwight Eisenhower that, uh, that we stood by Chiang Kai-shek at that time, resisting this Chinese effort to take these offshore islands, which if any of you have ever been, for example, to Kimoi, as I've had the pleasure to do, you can see China. <laughs> you don't need to be on Sarah Palin's front porch. You can see China uh, uh, across a relatively narrow strait. And after months of bombardment, China came away with nothing, nothing. Uh, now, things, things moved on fairly quickly. Uh, 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 Mao Zedong was also uh, pursuing a policy of starving his own people, which is what the Great Leap Forward was, helped distract the people from the defeat uh, in effect at Kimoi and Matsu. Only 20 to 50 million died as a result of the Great Leap Forward. Uh, didn't slow the, the Chinese communist uh, government down at all. But right after that came the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, obviously a confrontation between the Soviet Union uh, and, uh, uh, and the United States. And while it was going on, as example of what we should have understood better as the Sino-Soviet split, in publications in China, uh, the Beijing accused Khrushchev and, and the Soviets of adventurism of a policy that was too dangerous to pursue to try and put offensive missiles in Cuba. Uh, so a public criticism of their senior partner in the alliance between the two of them as it stood then. And then, although we know more about this denouement now than we did then, when Khrushchev appeared to have backed down, the Chinese accused him of capitulationism. So, you know, you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. But the point is the Chinese saw something they thought was too forward-leaning, uh, and they criticized uh, the, uh, the inevitable consequences, the appearance of defeat uh, that Khrushchev suffered, ultimately leading to his uh, downfall within the Soviet Union. Now, events moved forward, obviously, Mao Zedong, uh, with his second uh, brilliant idea, the Cultural Revolution that destroyed thousands of years of Chinese culture and, and brought the uh, country to near chaos until uh, after a few uh, sort of interim rulers, Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1982. And this is a seminal moment, the consequences of which we're still feeling in uh, Western relations with China. Deng Xiaoping broke from communist orthodoxy, introducing market-oriented reforms into the Chinese system. He famously said, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. Um, and, and the consequence of moving from orthodox Marxism to more, more market-oriented policies was a substantial growth in wealth across the Chinese economy. Uh, we, we see the continuing effects of it. It, uh, uh, it was dramatic, uh, and it had a dramatic effect on the international economy as well. But from this early success uh, in, in this introduction of market-oriented reforms, the West as a whole drew two uh, conclusions that have formed the basis of American foreign policy and really Western foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China since then. Uh, both of them have turned out to be 100% wrong. The, the first uh, foundational conclusion was that, um, that in the international sphere, this increase in wealth, this increase of Chinese interaction with the rest of the economy would, would uh, take place in what uh, my friend Bob Zellick once called a peaceful rise of China and that China would be a responsible stakeholder in world affairs, that in increasing economic connections would bring increased uh, compliance with international norms in the economic sphere and the political sphere as well, so that the growth of Chinese wealth would make it a more responsible international partner and not a threat but really growing toward uh, something like the economies of the, of the Asian tigers and their behavior. The second premise was that this increase in wealth 
uh, would lead to increasing democratization across China. And I remember well hearing people say, you know, I just heard of, a, of an election out in some village in some province in the middle of nowhere in China, and to compete for the headman position in the village, there were two candidates. And, and that's going to spread, and uh, other villages will, will have elections. And, and then you'll have democratic elections at the provincial level, and then you'll have democratic elections at the national level, because as you get a middle class in China, they're going to act like the middle class everywhere, and we will have democratic government. So the combination of these two uh, theories, principles, was that uh, China would begin to look a lot like the rest of the world. And what could go wrong, really? Uh, well, here, here's what started to go wrong. Um, the fact was that uh, China did not become a responsible actor in international economic affairs. The history is now incontestable that China's economic advance has been fueled in substantial part by the theft of intellectual property on a sustained and systematic basis without consequences through most of the industrial democracies. Uh, there have been repeated forced technology transfers as a condition to invest in China. There's been sustained discrimination against foreign traders uh, and investors. Obviously, the main capital allocation decisions in China in, in domestic capital have remained in the control of the government and the Communist Party. And after being admitted to the World Trade Organization, which was a development that was supposed to guarantee that international norms would change behavior in China. We see that what China has done has taken what should be a free trade organization and turned it into an instrument of Chinese mercantilism. All the while, we've just watched it happen. Uh, and so the, the first uh, uh, premise, which was this increase in Chinese wealth would make it a more responsible actor internationally has failed. On the second, the idealism of, of China becoming a democratic society has turned about to be the exact opposite. Uh, Xi Jinping is the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. His thought has been elevated to the equivalent of Marx, Lenin, and Mao Zedong. He is re-centralizing political and economic authority in the center. We should expect to see that endorsed uh, later in the year. Uh, and so the, the, the second prediction has, has been 180 degrees off just as the first. China has not become more democratic. If anything, it's become more authoritarian. Uh, and in terms of its uh, uh, non-economic policies uh, around the world, the uh, extent of Chinese militarization uh, is unprecedented. Uh, they have, across the full spectrum of military capabilities, uh, been engaged in a sustained buildup at the nuclear level, ballistic missiles, launching a blue water navy for the first time in 600 years, developing area denial and anti-access weapons capabilities to push the United States and its allies back from the uh, western shores of the Pacific, uh, anti-satellite weapons to uh, take our uh, capabilities uh, out of the uh, Earth orbit in any kind of conflict or run up to conflict, the development of one of the world's most effective uh, cyber warfare programs. Uh, th this is not the mark of a uh, country engaged in a peaceful rise. Now, what has happened is uh, uh, was predictable for those who were watching China carefully. I don't, do not include myself in that number because I, I was optimistic about this uh, as well. What we failed to recognize was something that Deng Xiaoping said right at the beginning of his rule, which is slightly longer, but I'll condense it. He said, hide your capabilities and bide your time. And a lot of people in the West who saw that said, what a moderate policy. <laughs> that is to say, deceive your enemies and wait for the right moment. That's moderation. Obviously, this was part of our failure to understand exactly uh, what was going on in China. Uh, I don't think Xi Jinping really is anything other than the uh, final manifestation that hide and bide is gone. Uh, and instead of hide and bide, we've got wolf warrior diplomacy uh, that reflects what the real feelings inside Beijing are. 
Now, th this is where at, at, uh, in the period in the last 10 years where this growing Russia-China Entente becomes significant. In the first days of uh, the People's Republic of China, obviously it was the Soviet Union that was the senior partner in the relationship. That is completely reversed today. Uh, Russia is uh, obviously the junior partner, except in certain important areas like nuclear weapons capability and sophisticated weapons system. But the size of China, the proximity of China to underpopulated areas in Russia, uh, the economic relationship that uh, the China and Russia have, all make uh, Russia a lesser partner. I, I have talked to Russian officials about this and said, you know, this, this may not turn out very well for you. And I can tell you in, in complete candor, I had no impact on them, whatever. They, they see this uh, entente as entirely beneficial uh, to Russia or that they have no alternative. In a perfect world in the West, we would be trying to find ways to split them away from China. But I think we're likely going to be unsuccessful. And so the Russians and the Chinese have a division of labor. Russia worries about Europe and the Middle East. China worries about its periphery along the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East. And they work together to uh, advance their interest. Uh, we can see this in a, in a, uh, in a variety of ways. I think the, the war in Ukraine today is a good example of this. There are people in the West who say China's so put off by this invasion of Ukraine that it's such a terrible thing that they regret how close they've come to the Russians. That's utter nonsense. Uh, you can guarantee that Russian financial institutions that are the subject uh, of Western economic sanctions are finding ways to launder their money through the opaque Chinese financial system. That China would be more than willing to increase its already extensive purchases of Russian oil and gas and take it across pipelines across their border rather than lift uh, gas and oil uh, in the Persian Gulf. All of, all of these circumstances have helped contribute to making Russia more of a junior partner uh, to China. And by the way, given the uh, performance of the Russian military in Ukraine, all those Russian troops that are still stationed along the Chinese border uh, now constitute even less of a security threat to China than they did before because the Chinese have seen up close exactly what uh, Russia, uh, what Russia's forces are really uh, capable of doing. Uh, there are a variety of other uh, examples, Iran being the most important currently where China and Russia support Iran, although for different reasons. China supports it as a purchaser of oil and gas. Russia supports it as a member of a new cartel, where these two, two nations, both heavily sanctioned, can work together. Now, what are the, what are the conclusions that we can draw from, from these examples and many others about what the direction of Western policy ought to be? The first is, that the uh, American Declaration, originally during the Obama administration, but repeated endlessly since then, is that the United States has to pivot toward Asia. Pivot toward Asia. It probably sounds good in Australia, I'll give you that, but the United States can't pivot. The United States is a global power. We, as we like to say, have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And when we pivot away from Europe, I mean, really, Europe's kind of a secondary theater, right? Who cares about that? Or pivot away from the Middle East, who cares about Israel? Who cares about the Gulf Arab oil production? Uh, we, we can pivot away all we want toward China. They're going to pivot right into the areas we've pivoted away from. So it sounds very stylish, but it is completely uh, devoid of substance, misses the uh, reality that China, being the existential threat of the 21st century is going to confront us where we are and where we're not. Uh, and if we don't adopt a global approach to this, uh, we're, we're, in, we're in deep trouble. Now, what it also should say to business in the United States, in Europe, uh, here, all, really, uh, almost everywhere, is that political risk is back. Uh, globalism was supposed to have brought the end of all these troublesome things like borders and all that sort of thing. And, and there was, if you didn't want to invest in the United States, if you didn't want to 
put a plant in Central America, go ahead and put it in China. Really? So what? A little bit higher transportation costs, lower labor costs. What, what could go wrong with that? We are going to go through a very substantial period of difficulty in the relationship and businesses that don't uh, uh, attempt to mitigate the effect of political risk uh, are going to face consequences. That's not to say that we need, uh, as some people in the United States advocate, uh, a new industrial policy to unwind from China. Other than in some selective national security related areas, I don't think that's necessary. But I think it's happening already when companies consider potential new capital allocations. Why put it in China when you could put it someplace that's not going to steal your intellectual property? You're not at risk of nationalization, and maybe your supply uh, uh, system is a little bit closer to home. I think all of that is going to increase, and I think uh, the sooner we get about it, the, the better we're going to be. And I think that it's important uh, for the United States, maybe not so important here, important to resist this idea that because China is so important, we can give up on Europe. We can say, you deal with Ukraine. It's not our problem. We can say, you deal with Iran. That's not our problem. We can say, let's withdraw from Afghanistan. Really, what, what difference is that going to make? All of these are steps that weaken the United States uh, uh, internationally, not just in the confrontation with China, but in, in the larger picture. And I think this debate is very important to have. No, nobody likes to be told that history has returned. Uh, and we're still uh, suffering from the hangover of the collapse of the Soviet Union when uh, people declared the peace dividend. Really, everything's fine now. We can dramatically reduce our military expenditures. We're still suffering from that. Even after the attack on 9-11, we haven't built our defense expenditures uh, back up. People say, but you spend so much on defense and these other countries don't spend enough. The combined budgets of Russia and China don't come close to the United States. Well, that's their reported budgets. OK, everybody knows more than they should about our military budget. We don't know a lot about Russia and China uh, and and the budgets are not comparable. Would you like to be paid as a member of a service member in the United States or as a member of the People's Liberation Army? Think about that for a minute. If, if you if you took out factors like salary and benefits, which our service members deserve, deserve at higher levels than they get and compare them to what our adversaries pay, you, you can see what a difference it makes. But the fact is, because the United States is a global power, we have to be in a position to defend our interest in multiple theories, multiple theaters at the same time. Not, not 25 years ago, we still believed we had to be able to fight two wars simultaneously and have the capability to do it. Right now, we can barely fight one war with a hope that the contingency of a second war doesn't occur. Uh, it's not a luxury that we can continue. Uh, and I think that if, uh, if we hadn't uh, drawn enough conclusions from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we've got plenty of lessons ahead of us from China's uh, intention vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan and really all around the, its periphery in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, a lot of people have said that, uh, uh, that, that the United States has been, in some respects, uh, unduly provocative uh, toward China, that somehow Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, poses a threat uh, to the security of China, and, and that we shouldn't have done it. We should have, we should have um, persuaded her not to. Good luck with that. Uh, the, the fact is... Uh, th this was a teaching moment for many people in the United States when they woke up and said, what do you mean the Chinese are telling us where our officials can go? Who, who gave them that authority? Uh, we don't tell them where their officials can go. We know where they go. They go to places uh, that are adversaries of the United States. They buy oil from Iran. Uh, at uh, uh, contrary to the sanctions. They're not at all cooperative on that. Look at what they're doing with Russia. But the Chinese response to the Pelosi visit was something that was very important for people to see. This was not some new escalation by China. This was the very picture of what they've been thinking for a long, long time. And it says that uh, to, to, the, to the nations in the Indo-Pacific uh, in particular, 
that that threat is manifest right now, and we are not collectively prepared for it. Now, on Taiwan, I think there are two levels of response. One is to try and deter a Chinese attack in the near term by providing Taiwan with sufficient support that we change the cost-benefit calculus in Beijing, <clears throat> that the cost of taking Taiwan is far too high for the Chinese to bear. I don't think the Chinese want Taiwan to be a heap of smoking rubble. I think they've seen the use of force in Ukraine. It doesn't appeal to them. They want Taiwan's enormous productive capability uh, intact. Uh, and besides, as you may have noticed, Taiwan is 110 miles away across some uh, pretty choppy water. It's not like walking across a border as the Russians did. And they couldn't even do that very well. Uh, this, is, this is not something China is going to provoke in a military sense. But what it will do is create a crisis by pretext and try and create a situation that challenges the United States to come to Taiwan's side, throw a blockade around the island. Maybe they'll call it a quarantine, as we did in the Cuban Missile Crisis. But they will basically say, uh, this is ours and you're not coming back. So if the United States fails to stand up to that, the Chinese have, uh, have followed Sun Tzu's philosophy. They've achieved their objective without the use of military force. They will have hegemony over Taiwan and annexation will follow. On the other hand, if the United States stands up to that kind of uh, provocation, uh, as I have to say uh, uh, in full uh, candor, Bill Clinton did in the late 1990s when uh, Beijing threatened uh, Taiwan, and Clinton sent two carrier battle groups steaming toward Taiwan and through the Taiwanese Strait, and the Chinese backed down. Uh, now, times are different. The Chinese military capability is greater, but the political uh, issue is uh, exactly the same. The, the second thing we need to do, and to do it urgently, is to build Taiwan into part of the collective security structures we need to develop in Asia. Uh, it, we, we do not see in the Indo-Pacific the kind of dense alliance capabilities that we have in Western Europe with NATO and elsewhere. Uh, we're in a very primitive stage in that sense. But it seems to me inevitable if the, for the ta Taiwanese, if this remains a China versus Taiwan competition, ultimately Taiwan loses. If this becomes a China versus uh, much of the rest of the Indo-Pacific periphery, then Taiwan is safe, as are the other countries that join with us. So in terms of the way ahead, uh, I have to say <clears throat> uh, uh, respectfully, Australia once again has led the way, along with Japan, and it was really Shinzo Abe's idea to create this quad, India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. It's still in a very early stage of development. It's not yet uh, a military or collective defense alliance. It has a long way to go, but it's an amazing creation that five years ago, uh, even after Abe proposed it, it was going nowhere. This is something we can all follow up on, and I think Australia, at a time of what I would call uh, inadequate uh, uh, presidential leadership in the United States, Australia can be very creative in, in, in making suggestions about how to proceed. The second is AUKUS, uh, which I am still amazed the Biden administration agreed to, and congratulations to whomever in Australia managed to get it through our bureaucracy. Uh, this is a stunning development. Uh, it's a fantastic idea for Australia that increases your security uh, well beyond uh, the, the immediate territory around Australia, projects it into the Indian Ocean. It's a huge investment for the future. It's a major uh, 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 victory, really, for uh, policymaking in Australia. It has the added benefit of bringing Britain, now independent, finally, of the European Union, uh, back into playing in, in the Pacific area. And uh, the more they do, the better. And for the United States, as we are uh, in budget challenges to have adequate military spending, to have 8, 10, whatever it might be, nuclear-powered submarines uh, under the Australian flag, uh, is, is, is simply incomparable. The, the paradigm that AUKUS represents uh, has enormous potential across the region. 
uh, Japan, I've got to believe, is saying to themselves, nuclear-powered submarines count us in, and, and maybe for more than 10, maybe for 20 or 30. Uh, plenty of other countries in Southeast Asia are thinking about how they can benefit from closer cooperation. Uh, I think it's important that we not hold up uh, to try and find the perfect paradigm that covers all of the uh, across society challenges that China's posing to us. I think we proceed in a Burkean fashion. We, we do it from the ground up, organization by organization, partnership by partnership. We'll get to where we need to go. Uh, and, and I think the opportunities are all there. So this, this challenge that, um, uh, that the China and Russia in their Entente pose for us uh, is going to be uh, very, very difficult to overcome. There's no doubt about it. But it's also the case that once we are alerted, and you and Australia have been alerted before the United States and others, once alerted, this is for us to lose. And I don't think that's going to be the result. Thank you very much. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. <laughs>